This video is sponsored by Connell Guides. To get your hands on the most intelligent study guides on the market for GCSE and A-level English Literature, as well as GCSE and A-level History, visit connellguides.com and use code RS15 at checkout for 15% off your order. Act 1, Scene 1 of Romeo and Juliet, or as I like to call it, the opening brawl. Which annotations could we make for that scene? Let's find out. How's it going Revision Squad? Dystopia Junkie here with another GCSE English Literature video for you. And in this one, we are going to annotate the opening brawl from Act 1, Scene 1 of William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So in this video, I'm going to work through that scene and provide over two dozen annotations for it, focusing on how it helps to create certain impressions about the play's characters, how it relates to the play's themes, and how it formally works as a piece of drama. Before we get much deeper into this video then, I strongly recommend that you have a copy of the play in front of you, three different highlighters, and a pen to take notes with. If anything I say or do in this video does help you out, please don't forget to let me know. You could drop this video a like to show your appreciation, you could write me a lovely comment, you could share the video around with anybody else who might benefit from watching it, and you could, of course, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to my channel too. So then, which annotations could we make for Act 1, Scene 1? So as I said in the video introduction, I'm going to be making annotations that relate to the play's characters, themes and form. In these annotation videos, when I say form, I mean how this extract functions as a piece of drama. That means I will focus on the extract's relation to the overall structure of the play, whether it uses any dramatic devices, what audience responses might be, and so on. Moreover, some annotations might relate to more than one category, so if you see something that is shaded both blue and green, for example, that is your cue to know that its comment is about how the extract relates to the play's characters and themes. Anyway, Act 1, Scene 1 opens with Samson and Gregory, two Capulet servants who are armed with swords and shields as they walk through a public place in Verona. In this extract, Samson and Gregory banter for a bit before discussion turns to the Montague household. So in terms of making annotations, let's think about those initial stage directions. Now because the play opens with the Capulet's servants, the audience can see the extent to which the play's dramatic conflict, which is also quite literally a conflict, dominates its setting. Moreover, you could argue that because the play opens with servants, so lower class characters who are employed by the families rather than the actual family members themselves, this effect is reinforced because the play's dramatic conflict is shown to affect people from across class divisions. Second, I would like to think about when the mood of this scene changes. As I said earlier, Samson and Gregory banter for a while, but this changes when Samson mentions that he is moved to strike quickly. To me, this exchange highlights the power of the play's conflict because it provides a sudden change in Samson's behaviour. He was enjoying himself before, and now, just because he thought about the Montagues, he is in an aggressive mood. Moving forwards, Samson and Gregory share a conversation laden with violent and aggressive undertones. Samson expresses several violent desires and Gregory attempts to de-escalate his colleague's aggressiveness. So in these lines of Samson's dialogue, the intersection between the themes of gender and violence is apparent. This is because when Samson states that he wishes to push Montague's men from the wall, he clearly means to do them harm whereas his desire to thrust the Montague's maids to the wall suggests that he wants to either hurt or, given the connotations of thrust, sexually assault them. Together, these desires suggest that Samson is an aggressively masculine character. Next, when Gregory reminds Samson that the quarrel is between our masters and us their men, the use of pronouns and juxtaposition between men and masters highlights that Gregory and Samson are loyal to the Capulet family. Moreover, and I haven't written this on screen, 
the gendered connotations of men and masters suggests that Gregory wishes to diffuse Samson's sexually aggressive desires by reminding him that the women are not involved in the feud at all. Now Samson seems to ignore this, for when he says that he will be cruel with the maids once he has fought with the men, we get the impression that Shakespeare suggests that violence empowers men, which might reflect on the generally patriarchal nature of Elizabethan England. And last, when Samson says the heads of the maids or their maiden heads, this use of polypteton sees Samson reference both violence and sexual violence because the term maidenhead was a word meaning virginity in Shakespeare's time. In other words, he wants to either behead the Montague maids or sexually assault them. As such, the extreme emotions instilled by the feud are revealed. The scene progresses once Samson and Gregory notice that two Montague servants are swiftly approaching. But first, let's look at the wordplay apparent in the flesh-fish parallel at the top of this particular extract. This bantering provides a comic moment in what has otherwise been a fairly serious, tense or bloody-minded scene. The play therefore demonstrates an inner tension between having a serious tone and a light-hearted tone which I think you could say is indicative of Romeo and Juliet's generic experimentation. As I have said in my video about the play's genre, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy that possesses many comic elements, and certainly the first half of the play could be mistaken for a comedy. By flip-flopping between these contrasting tones in this scene, Shakespeare shows that his play may navigate various generic boundaries. At the end of this particular extract, I want to look at Samson's desire to bite his thumb at the Montague servants. This provocative gesture for biting your thumb at someone in Shakespeare's time was akin to giving them the middle finger today, shows that violence not only informs Samson's words, but his actions as well. Now, I am aware that this mini extract is looking a little bit bare, but that's because we will be revisiting it at the end of this video, so please do hang on. Abraham and Balthazar, the two Montague servants, enter the scene. Now after a bit of verbal sparring and toing and throwing, they and the Capulet servants have a fight. Now something that stands out to me in this part of the play is the repeated use of the term sir. I interpret this as being mock politeness or sarcasm because the servants do not possess a high enough status to warrant this title. As such, by being sarcastic or making a mockery of politeness, we can see that the servants really do want to have a scrap. This verbal sparring sees them goad and taunt each other, after all. Next, let's consider Samson's aside. Because he is suddenly having a quick word with Gregory about the legality of starting the fight, we could argue that he is a cowardly character because he does not immediately rush into battle. Alternatively, it could suggest that he is a relatively law-abiding character who doesn't want to get into trouble, thus implying that his previous talk of aggression and sexual violence was nothing more than mere bluster. Now the latter half of the extract on screen sees the servants argue about whose man or master is better, which reinforces the connection between conflict and family loyalty in this play. And last, let's look at Samson's command, draw if you be men. Here, the Capulet servant associates violence with masculinity, thus reinforcing Elizabethan gender roles. So the servants fight. Then Benvolio turns up and he attempts to break it up. However, Tybalt then turns up too, and then he starts fighting with Benvolio. Benvolio's imperative, part fools, sees him associate violence with idiocy, which suggests that he is a peaceful character. And this impression is reinforced by the following stage directions, because they see him attempts to break up the fight with his actions, not just his words. Unfortunately, Tybalt, Benvolio's antithesis, has other ideas. You see, by threatening death, expressing that he despises peace, and initiating a fight with Benvolio, our first impression of Tybalt is that he is an incredibly aggressive character, which could also suggest that he is hypermasculine. His aggression is so extreme, in fact, that I would say that he is emblematic of the theme of violence in Shakespeare's play. The fight escalates. 
more servants join in, Veronese citizens get involved and try to break up the fight, and then Lord Montague and Lord Capulet attempt to get involved in it as well. Now the initial stage direction recalls the line in the prologue that states civil blood makes civil hands unclean, which starts to verify the summary given to the audience at the beginning of the play. Now something I've not really noticed before is the first citizen's line, down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. To me, it implies that although the Capulets and Montagues possess a high social status within Verona, they are actually quite unpopular. Maybe the everyday Veronese citizens are fed up of the constant violence and disorder. With the theme of gender in mind, I noticed Lord Capulet's request for his sword and Lord Montague's demand to be let go. Because these characters clearly desire a fight, Shakespeare creates the impression that violence is an inherently masculine trait. Likewise, because Lady Capulet and Lady Montague prevent their husbands from fighting or question their husbands' desires to fight, Shakespeare suggests that being sensible or non-violent is a typically feminine characteristic. Interestingly, the parallels apparent in the Lords and Ladies suggests to me that, despite the conflict between their families, the Montagues and Capulets aren't actually all that different. And last, when Lord Montague says, let me go, his dialogue contains what you could call a hidden stage direction, for it is implied that Lady Montague is holding him back. At last, just before things really threaten to get out of hand, Prince Aeschylus turns up with his attendants and breaks things up. Eventually. At the end of his second line, there is a dash. Now this dash implies that Prince Aeschylus is either trailing off as he begins to address the brawlers, or that he is changing who he is addressing. This lack of commitment or lack of certainty when it comes to commanding people makes me wonder if Prince Aeschylus is not a particularly strong leader after all. Indeed, when he asks, will they not hear, we learn that the brawlers do not initially listen to the prince. This suggests to me that his authority is not always respected in Verona. Next, when he threatens the brawlers with torture if they do not listen to him, Shakespeare creates the impression that violence always leads to more violence because it can only be stopped by increasingly greater violent acts. And last of all, when Prince Aeschylus is able to finally address Lord Capulet and Lord Montague, his authority is evident in his use of the imperatives shall and come, which show a strong degree of certainty regarding him meeting and speaking with the lords, presumably to tell them off. Now jumping back for a moment, this exchange between Samson and Gregory is something that I think you ought to make a note on. So I would like to ask you, what does this exchange suggest about them as characters? Or how does this exchange relate to the theme of conflict and violence? Now this question could be something that you think about and make your own annotation for, thus developing your notes for this extract even further. But what I would really love to see is your response to this question down in the comments section too. If you are feeling brave enough to share your answer with me, remembering to write in full sentences too of course, I will be sure to give it a read and respond to it as well. I'll even pin the best answer too, so why not give it a go if you're after a tiny bit of internet clout. Now regardless of whether you answer that question, I would like to thank you for watching this video. If I have managed to help you out as you study or revise Shakespeare's play, please do let me know by giving this video a like, writing a comment on it, sharing it around and subscribing to my channel too if you haven't done so already. All of that stuff helps me out absolutely loads, and so I really, really, really do appreciate it. Anyway, before I finish recording, all that there is left for me to say is that I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are studying or revising, please remember to take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. So what are some of the key ideas from Act 1, Scene 1, or more specifically, the opening brawl? Well, I would say that we learn that violence and aggression are shown to be hyper-masculine qualities. We learn also that Benvolio is peaceful, but that Tybalt, his antithesis, is incredibly violent. And last of all, we learn that although Prince Aeschylus is ostensibly the key authority figure in Verona, 
he's not necessarily listened to all of the time.